Thank you so much, Janice and Michelle. I took a week of vacation, uh, actually left on the Tuesday before Memorial Day, and we went to the beach for a week. And I don't know if you've ever given a whole lot of thought to something like this, but imagine what it's like to pack for six kids and two adults for a week. And as you do that, what you'll begin to, to think is that this feels less like packing to go on vac vacation and more like, like moving. And so uh, anyway, uh, in, in the days leading up to, and especially the, the day that we left, uh, it's, it's just a mad dash and trying to make sure that you've got all of this stuff packed. And we've got a couple of staging areas in the den. There's some suitcases and bags in the kitchen. There's some, uh, some more boxes that have some food and some bags and stuff in there. And so on the, on the day that we leave, my responsibility uh, that I want to make sure it's taken care of is to get everything properly packed into the van. So once everything is in their bags, I get stuff into the van. I, I get the van packed. Uh, we get the kids, we get everybody in there. And then Caroline and I make very quickly a cursory run through the house to make sure uh, everything that we need to have is on the van. Anyway, we finish that, we uh, lock the doors, we get in the van, and we head out the driveway. And every time we do something like this, we give a high five on the way out because it's like, whew, whew, we finally survived that. And so we're, we're leaving the neighborhood, and I don't know if you're like this, but almost every time I do something like this, I have this feeling, I I've left something. And even if I haven't, there's that feeling. Maybe you experience the same thing, and I don't know how to turn that off. But uh, we have been driving. Uh, we have, in fact, we just crossed the, the sign that says we're, we're out of Guilford County. We're on 220, headed south. We're about 20 miles from the house. When Caroline says to me this, did you get the bathing suit bag? And so the bathing suit bag is the bag that has all of the bathing suit, swim shirts, all that stuff in there. And as soon as she said it, I, I just kind of felt sick to my stomach. You ever, you ever get that where you just kind of throw up in the back of your throat? That's kind of what I felt like. Anyway, um, but I said, I don't know, I need to stop and check. And I felt like I already knew the answer, but I need to go ahead and stop and check. And so we, it, it took a little bit before we could even get to an exit to stop. We stop, I get out, and I look, sure enough, we have left that bag at home. In fact, we know exactly where it is. It's in the den. So we drive 20 miles back to the house because there's really no reasonable option because uh, to, get, to get to the beach and to go find and buy eight bathing suits and swim shirts, not only is that a pain in the neck, it's a pain in the pocketbook. So we drive 20 miles back to the house. Sure enough, that bag is in the den. We get it and we get loaded up to drive another 20 miles back to where we were just 25 minutes ago. And it was so frustrating. It was so frustrating. And we're thinking to ourselves, you know what? We should have had a checklist. We should have had a checklist. You know, we use checklists all the time, though. And you, maybe you're a checklist type person. But when you, when you have a checklist, let me ask you this. Why do you have that? Whether it's going on a trip or you're going to the grocery store, why do you have a checklist? It's pretty simple. Because you want to make sure that you don't forget anything. That there's important stuff you want to remember. Today we're landing the plane of a series that I started at the beginning of the month. It's called One Small Step, I Can Share Jesus. And the premise of this, the focus of this, has been to remind us all that if we are, if you are a follower of Jesus, that you have individually, that we collectively have a mandate from the Lord to intentionally and regularly be sharing with others the hope that's within us so that they too might come to have a personal connection with Jesus. We are all directed to do this. And while that is the case, it's, it's likely that you would say uh, what we probably all should say, and that is that we've dropped the ball. We've dropped it individually, we've dropped it collectively. And it's my hope for this church, for us as, as a collection of individuals, that God has been, that he is, and he will continue to use the stuff that we've been thinking about to, to reignite and to, to to refocus and to regather our attention about the priority of pointing others to Jesus. And as we think about that, and as we think about being intentional and engaging others, and even this week as we have opportunities, especially over the next couple of weeks with our, our Backyard Kids Clubs, to engage people and engage families with the gospel, before we go, I think there's some stuff we need to make sure that we remember. We need a checklist of sorts. And I believe in Scripture we get some stuff that if we pay attention to, I think will be a good checklist for us to follow. But what is it? You see, I believe, starting in Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 1. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 1. If you would, look with me in your Bibles there. Luke 10, verse 1. 
Luke tells us this, that after this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Now go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Skip down to verse 17. They've been sent out, now they've returned. Verse 17 says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. All right, at this point in Luke's gospel, the ministry of Jesus is in full swing. And he is, uh, he's already called the 12 disciples, and he's got them, and they're called alongside him. And as he has them, Jesus is keenly aware, and it's very logical. Uh, the more people that you can get connected to you that you can also equip and send out, that magnifies sig significantly and exponentially the scope of the work and of the ministry. And so at this point, Jesus appoints and sends out 72. And as we see this, I believe we see some items that ought to be on our checklist. Now with respect to the 72, now, some have speculated that the number itself is significant because it was believed that 72 was the number of known nations that existed in the world. And the thought was, uh, this, is, this is one representative of every nation that's known to exist. Well, that sounds nice, and that's very pleasant. Could it be right? Maybe. Could it be wrong? I don't know. All we know is that Jesus sends out 72, sends them out in pairs of two people, 36 pairs that he goes and he sends out. And as Jesus sends them out, according to verse 1, he sends them out in pairs, so 36 pairs, and I believe in this is the first principle, the first thing that we need to make sure that we have on our checklist that we don't forget, and that's this. You are not flying solo. As you and I have been, and we are sent out, we are, and you are not flying solo. Hearing that, you may say, well, that's obviously a reference to the fact that he sent them out in pairs, and so that the, they weren't individuals, that, but there are a couple of individuals paired up together. But while that, that is true, I want you to realize also that it was not just that you have a pair, but each of these pairs is part of a larger group, 72, and how many of them have been sent out? Every single one of them. All 72 have been sent out, and they're not sent out individually, but they're all sent out collectively, individually, and then also in pairs. And I believe that helps remind us of the fact that every single follower of Jesus has been commissioned and sent out by him intentionally so that we might be able to point others to him. But as we, as we are sent out, you need to remember that you're not flying solo, and I believe that has a couple of, of applications and, and, and is important for a couple of reasons, and the first is this. For some, the notion exists in their mind that only a few have been sent out. And it's those that are involved in vocational ministry or it's, it's uh, the really busy lay leaders within the local fellowship. Those are the ones that have been sent out by the Lord to point people in his direction. But is that correct? Well, absolutely not. Who has been sent out? Every person that's a follower of Jesus. Who's excluded? Those that are not followers of Jesus. Do you know who should not be telling people about Jesus? Lost people. But apart from that, who should be pointing others to Jesus and pointing them in his direction? Everyone that is connected to him. And the temptation is to, to have this thought and believe that somehow you yourself are excluded. But the reality is that none of us, if you have a relationship with Jesus, is excluded from the fact that you have, we have, we've all been sent out. Now, there's, there's another benefit of this and. That's th that it helps prevent the martyr complex. This helps prevent the martyr complex when you remember that you're not flying solo, that you're not at this alone. And let me see if I can illustrate that thought from the Bible itself. Perhaps you remember the story of Elijah back in the Old Testament. And if you uh, go back to around uh, 1 Kings 18, you read about how uh, uh, Elijah has this amazing, literally, mountaintop moment 
uh, representing the Lord with the prophets of Baal. And, and hopefully you remember, and you can go back and read the story about how God miraculously consumed this sacrifice and put to shame all of these false prophets and put to shame and to reveal the fact that Baal was absolutely a false god. So he has absolutely had this mountaintop moment. I mean, just absolute pinnacle. Got to be really exciting. Got to think, man, this is great. Front row seat, God's done some amazing things. But no sooner has that happened than Israel's wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel effectively put out a death warrant against Elijah. And so Elijah is a man on the run. And by the time you get to the 19th chapter, Elijah is not on the mountain. He's in a cave, and he's hiding. And he calls out to the Lord, and he says this, I alone am left. It's just, it's just me, God. I'm all that you've got. It's just me and my lonesome, and they're getting ready to put the crosshairs on me. I'm already in their crosshairs. It's all on me. And do you remember what God did? God reminded him that within Israel there were another 7,000 that had not yet bowed their knee to Jesus. Excuse me, that had not yet bowed their knee to Baal. God was reminding him that he wasn't the only resource, that everything did not ride on his shoulders, that Elijah was part of a, something bigger than what he even was aware of, and that if there were others, even if he didn't know about them, there were others that were absolutely a part of it. Listen, if you and I individually start taking seriously what God has called us to, that's going to be great, but hopefully you'll realize not everyone that's on the team is going to be doing their part. It's, it's always been that way. Unfortunately, it's always going to be that way. And as much as we want to do in terms of giving each other a swift kick in the rear to motivate, to get in the game, there's always going to be those that, that are content to sit on the bench and to remain on the sidelines. And those that are in the game can very well get to the point where they're like, well, it's just me. Let me just remind you, on your checklist, keep this in your mind, it's never just you. Why? Because you're part of a bigger team. Even if you can't see all the players on the field, you are not flying solo. Keep that on your checklist. But there's something else you need to remember, and that's this. The need is greater than the supply. As, as you and I get engaged in the responsibility that is ours, the need is and will always remain greater than the supply. In verse 2, Jesus says that the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Well, that's, in many ways, that's, that's very promising. But this fact that the harvest is great. Because it's not like you're walking, hey, uh, I need you to walk through a 10-acre field of corn and there's three ears of corn somewhere on all of these stalks. That's not what's being said. Jesus is saying that there's a massive harvest. And of course, when he's talking about harvest, he's not talking about wheat. He's not talking about corn. He's not talking about lima beans. He's talking about people, uh, souls of people that can be and should be and that, that he is working to draw into a relationship with himself. And so there are lots and lots of people that God is in the process of drawing to himself that need to be effectively just gathered in the nets. And about that, what does Jesus say that you ought to do? Let me see if I can answer it this way. When we moved to Greensboro, uh, it was in December of 2010. I started here in October. We didn't get moved until December. And we used movers to, to get us and all of our junk up here. And so at that point, we had three kids. Uh, Philip was the youngest. He was about 18 months. And uh, th these movers had promised us. That, and they had said, listen, it's no big deal. You have all your stuff packed. We will get it loaded on the trucks. We will get those trucks to Greensboro, and it will be unloaded. You will spend the night in your new home here in Greensboro. So I'm like, okay. So they get, they get to our house in Charlotte that morning. They're going gangbusters. And they are, I mean, there's no one is gathering dust. And they are uh, getting this, this, the, this trucks loaded in a hurry. It's going great. But as the day wears on, we noticed they're slowing down a little bit and they're taking more breaks. And the breaks are getting longer. Anyway, we wound up leaving Charlotte a lot later than I ever thought. And I actually stayed back. I needed to do the final cleaning as Caroline was going to come to Greensboro with the three kids and uh, meet the movers here. Well, by the time they got to the house, somehow they got lost in Greensboro. And so by the time they get to our house, it's 930. 
And I, I'm on my way up 85 trying to get to the house when Caroline calls me and explains to me what has been going on. That the movers, once they got to the house, and again, everything that we own is in these trucks. We don't have enough. To, we, 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 there's no suitcases packed. There's nothing. We got an 18-month-old that is just spent that needs to go to bed. Uh, th this day is just not seeming to end, and the movers explained that it's really kind of late. They're just going to come back the next day. That was Caroline's response. And so she then explains to me what she's done. And she said that she, she called, she had the, the manager's number, and she called the manager and reminded them of their commitment, which is that this was going to be done that day, and explained, we are here. It's 9.30 at night. We don't have anything except that which is on the truck. And I don't care how many people you have to bring, but you get them here and you get this truck unloaded. By the time I get to Greensboro, <laughs> there are miraculously at least another four movers that have miraculously shown up. Why? Because the need was communicated and you said, we need more help. When you realize and when you highlight the need, what do you want to do? You want to ask for more help. And so as you and I get engaged, one of the things that we need to remember is that the need, the need for workers, the need for people to engage, the need for people to share is always going to exceed those that have gotten into the game. So what do you do? Jesus says you need to pray and pray that God will continue to work in the hearts of people that he might start drawing more and more and more and more people to get in the game. So it's not just that you're in it, that's great, but as you're in it, you make sure that you're praying because the need is and will remain greater than the supply. Keep that on your checklist. But there's another thing that you see that's going on in this passage, which I would describe this way. You are harvesting fruit, not producing it. You are harvesting fruit, not producing it. Pay attention to Jesus' statement at the end of verse 2. He says, pray to who? He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Lord is synonymous with master. It conveys the idea that he is in charge. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to do wor what? To send workers where? Into his field. It is a reminder of ultimately this reality. The process of people coming into a relationship with the Lord is based ultimately and entirely on what he has done and is doing. And it's not simply that Jesus uh, gave his life, died, was buried, and was resurrected. That's part of it. But also that he, through the person of the Holy Spirit, is working in the hearts of people. And he is inviting and he is, in, he is drawing. He is convicting. He is doing what you and I never could do. So it's a reminder to us that he is in charge and that he's the one that is producing the harvest. My responsibility, your responsibility is to, to gather it, to gather it. You're not saving anybody. Jesus does the saving. You're pointing people in his direction. Never lose sight of that. But there's another thing that you see in this passage, which is this. You will have a front row seat to the action. You will have a front row seat to the action. What do I mean by that? When you take seriously the fact that you have been sent out and start owning what it is that we are supposed to be about, you're going to be making yourself available to the Lord. And what's going to happen is that you're going to see God do some stuff that otherwise you would not have seen. These 72 begin to see that. You see that starting in verse 72. They come back, and it's not like Jesus is saying, all right, let's do a formal debriefing. What did What did you see? What did you experience? I mean, these guys come back, and they are super excited. I don't think... I don't think they were invited to share. They just started sharing. They just can't stop blabbing. Jesus, this was, this was amazing. This was amazing. We go out and we're sharing, and even, they said, even the demons submit to us in, in your name. And I don't have time to unpack everything that's going on in this when where Jesus says that he watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And Jesus is in that statement communicating that he was aware and could see the spiritual forces that are at work as Satan is, is getting kicked and kicked and kicked again as God is using these 72 to make a difference for time and eternity in the lives of those that they interact with. And these, these guys, what are they doing? They're seeing God do some amazing, amazing things. Hear me in this. Amazing things they would have never seen otherwise. Let me ask you this. If, if pressed, if you, were, if you had to answer this question, what have you seen God do? How would you answer that question? More specifically, 
What have you seen God do in the lives of people around you? How would you answer that question? It, it's very likely that across this room there's a whole lot of crickets in terms of how that question is answered. And you know why? Because there is stuff that we will never see, we will never observe, ways in which we will never ever see God work when we fail to share. But when you start sharing, remember, you will have a front row seat to the action. And I'm telling you, God is going to do some stuff. Some amazing stuff. Some significant things. Some things that can, sometimes can be described as miraculous. And you'll have a front row seat to that. But as you do so, you need to remember the final thought, which is this. Keep focused on the right things. Keep focused on the right things. As we take this responsibility of sharing Jesus seriously, we're, again, we're, we're going to be seeing God do some things. And we're going to be seeing God use us in some significant ways. And the more that that happens, the, the, the greater frequency with which that occurs, the more it is possible, and sometimes even likely, that we start thinking, Man, I've got the Midas touch. Look at, look at what I'm able to do. I mean, look at all this stuff. It's not just that I'm a part of, but we, we begin to think of these things as extensions of ourselves. And with that in mind, at the conclusion of this passage, Jesus offers a cautionary statement. He says in verse 20, he says, Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. So if, to, to broaden that, he's saying, Don't focus on the significant things that are occurring. Why does he not want them to do that? Because if they're focusing on the significant things that are occurring, they'll start to think they've been doing the significant things. Instead, what does he say to focus on? He says, focus on this, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So th these guys are telling Jesus, you're not going to believe all the stuff that we witness and amazing things, amazing things that, that even de demonic spirits are submitting to us and it's crazy, crazy, crazy. And they're pumped, they're excited, but Jesus is aware of what the temptation could possibly be and so he says, guys, I don't want you to focus on that. What I want you to keep grounded on, keep in the center crosshairs is this thought that you have your name written in heaven focus on the fact of what God has done in you that you were, who were estranged and living as an enemy of God not only has he looked at you as a friend but he's brought you into his family that you weren't just bad and made better but you were dead in your trespasses and sins and made alive in God through Christ Jesus that you who had a heart of stone now have been brought to life that you weren't just simply made to know God but you were made to be a son and a daughter of God keep your focus on that because when you keep your focus there you will never lose sight of the fact that it is God who is doing everything. Karl Barth is a name that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, he was one of the most significant theologians in the 20th century, and certainly there is a lot that I didn't agree with and don't agree with Barth on, but uh, it doesn't diminish the fact that he was profoundly significant and consequential in terms of theology in the 20th century. He was a Swiss-born theologian, and on April the 23rd of 1962, he was speaking in Rockefeller Chapel of the University of Chicago. And, and you, you see this still today. You'll have someone that comes and does a lecture, and afterwards they will do a, a Q&A time. And those are always kind of interesting. I love to see some of those things even today. But uh, as part of this Q&A time, Karl Barth is asked by someone, hey, it's kind of a simple question. I don't know, profound isn't the right word. They said, uh, Dr. Barth, could you summarize your theology in one sentence? So here's a guy who's written literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, who's made significant contributions to Christian theology, thinking uh, about and through the Bible. How can you summarize all of that in one statement? And this was his answer. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. What's that an encouragement? You need to keep the focus on what's important. And, it, and it's not... It's not 
celebrate and be glad that God is using you. Celebrate and be grateful that you've got a front row seat to the action. But don't ever let that get to be the focus because as it does, you'll start thinking about yourself. Instead, keep the main thing the main thing of what God has done for you. When that happens, everything stays in balance and the things that are most important don't get lost. With that in mind, would you bow your heads with me? As your heads are bowed, let me just say this to you. That Jesus has been sending people out since the first century. And he's still doing that today. To share with others how they might know him. And to experience for themselves the benefit of what he has accomplished and is giving as a free gift. If you're here today, or if it is that you are watching online, whether live or at some point later, let me ask you this. Have you experienced this relationship that he's made possible? Have you come to know and experience a relationship with him in a real and personal way? If you hadn't, if you have not, if there's question about it, we want to help you. When this service is over, I'll be available, Jamie will be available, there'll be others. If you, if you want some help, we want to help you. If you're watching or listening online, will you call us, will you email us, will you reach out to us? I promise you, we'll make whatever time we can is necessary so that you can experience a difference that honestly will change everything. But if you've already made that decision, let me ask you this. Are you aware, I mean really aware that you and I have, we've got some standing orders? Do your actions and conversations, even over the last couple of weeks, reflect that you know you've got some standing orders to share? If your actions and conversations don't reflect that, would you begin to even confess that to the Lord now? Will you say, Lord, I want that to be different? Will we collectively, as a church, will we say that we want to get off the bench intentionally and regularly engaging people with a message that will change not only the lives of people, but change their eternity. As the Lord is speaking to your heart even now, there's likely some stuff that you need to say to Him. As Karen plays, we just want to give you that opportunity, just you and the Lord, what He's saying to you, will you respond to Him even now? Karen was playing it just even now. An old song that many of us are familiar with. It says, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. Lord, if we're honest, it's easier for us to sing that than it is for us to say it and for it to be a true statement. Honestly, and we, I think we need to collectively confess this, we haven't loved sharing you because we haven't been doing it. I pray, Lord, that not only during this time, but long after this message is completed and we're in homes and offices, when school starts back, wherever it is that we are going, that we will remember that we are a people who have been commissioned, that are expected to be on mission, that we have standing orders. But as we do so, that we'll keep this checklist in mind. And as that happens, I think what will begin to occur is that we'll see you doing things and easier it will be for us to get to the point where we can sing it and say it from a true heart that we are people who love to tell the story. I pray that that might be our story. We say this to you in Christ's name. Amen. 
Well, God bless you. I'm so glad that you are here today. Uh, those of you who are deacons, if you just remember, we're going to be meeting briefly. Uh, as soon as the service is over, we'll meet over in the fellowship hall. If you want to head over there uh, as soon as we're done, please remember to be in prayer uh, for our Backyard Bible Clubs this week and next, some in the morning, some in the evening. And uh, if you want to know the exact times where you... If, you can even jot it down. You can be praying for them as they're going on. We can help you with that uh, as well. Uh, also, uh, just a quick reminder, and thank you for your faithful faithfulness and continued giving. Obviously, we're not passing offering plates, but they're available at each of the three uh, exits. Uh, if you're a guest, again, we're playing grateful that you are here today. If you'd like more information about this church, we'd love to share that with you. Uh, we're not going to um, show up at your house uh, and uh, pastor you unannounced unless you really want that. And then we visit third shift. So uh, no, I'm just messing with you. But uh, if you'd like some more information or if you're watching and you would like some more information, we'd be glad to help you in any way that we possibly can. It's good to see you. God bless you. I want to ask, what was the last week? One and three? I'm going to let two and four. Two and four. If you go ahead and you can be dismissed. If you let them get out and then one and three can be dismissed. <laughs>